All right, well, welcome everyone to uh, our webinar series. We built this city on HFRs, the hidden costs of flame retardants in insulation. Uh, this course is approved for one continuing education unit in AIBD, HSW, uh, GBCI, uh, Mary Green, uh, Certified Green Professionals, AIBD, and it may be approved for your state-based design or contractor license as well. Um, today I am your moderator. My name is Brett Little and I am the executive director here at the Green Home Institute. We're a nonprofit with a mission to empower people to make healthier and more sustainable choices in the renovation and construction of the places we live. Big thanks to our uh, sponsor, uh, Anderson Windows, who makes, this, makes these sessions all possible. Check them out for all of your windows and doors needs for new and existing homes. Do you support Greener Homes? Uh, you can check out our membership offerings that we have to help keep these sessions free to get discounts on green certification projects and other educational sessions. All right, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to our speaker today, um, Avery uh, Lindman. Uh, Avery has a bachelor's in chemistry from Harvard University and a master's in chemistry from the University of California, Berkeley. She currently leads the Green Science Policy Institute's policy work on flammability standards for furniture and insulation and manages the Institute's green building initiatives, including research to support healthier building materials for affordable housing. She has coordinated proposals to update the International Building Code and the International Residential, Re Residential Code and has contributed to efforts to update state and local building codes. So with that, I will hand it over to Avery. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Brett. Um, I'm very pleased to be here. So thank you very much to the Green Home Institute for hosting this webinar. Um, I would like to take today um, to talk about the work we're doing specifically around insulation in below grade applications. And as Brett said, the title of this talk is uh, We Built the City on HFRs, the Hidden Cost of Flame Returns in Insulation. So I work for the Green Science Policy Institute, and we're also uh, a nonprofit based here in Berkeley, California. And um, we do a variety of um, policy and science work. Um, we educate and build partnerships to develop innovative solutions for reducing use of harmful chemicals. Uh, we also provide unbiased scientific data and uh, motivate and participate in scientific research that can serve the public. Um, we serve as a, as a watchdog for regulations that could potentially increase the use of toxics in, in building and consumer products. And we also promote policy and purchasing um, to reduce the use of entire classes of harmful chemicals. One of our projects right now is called the Six Classes, and um, the Six Classes you'll see listed on your screen here. Um, it's not an exhaustive list, but this does comprise a, a majority of chemicals of concern that are commonly used in building and consumer products, um, including stain and water repellents, um, chlorinated antimicrobials, flame retardant chemicals, bisphenols and phthalates, um, certain organic solvents, and uh, certain metals as well. Um, and if you're interested, you can learn a lot more about that on uh, sixclasses.org or on our website. Today, I'm specifically going to be talking about the class of flame retardants, um, brominated, chlorinated, as well as phosphate flame retardants that have all been associated with um, environmental concern. And so we, we look for ways to reduce their use where they're not needed. Flame retardants are used primarily to meet flammability standards. Um, products usually, uh, depending on what they're used for and what they're made of, uh, might have some kind of flammability test requirement that they have to pass. And some of the major product categories containing flame retardants in the U.S. are electronics, so um, for instance, reacted into the printed circuit board uh, or else used in the plastic enclosure around an, an electronic. Um, they're used in building insulation, which is what I'll be talking about today. And they're also used in polyurethane foam. Um, so that's like flexible foam that you might find in your sofa or in transportation applications, um, things like that. Um, so I just want to start off with an example of flame retardants and why we're looking at this um, group of chemicals as a class. Um, flame retardants have a long history of use, and they're also associated with adverse environmental and health impacts. Um, and I'm going to talk just briefly about the example here of polybrominated diphenyl ethers, or PBDEs. 
PVDEs were used widely in a variety of um, applications. One is upholstered furniture. Um, they were also used in electronics. Um, textiles and, and other uses. Um, and they were used for a long time before we really understood uh, exactly what the implications of that would be. Um, PBDEs are very persistent. Um, they've been associated with neurodevelopmental impacts, inclu including decreased memory, uh, learning deficits, altered motor behavior, and hyperactivity. Um, they're associated with, with reproductive harm, um, and they're also um, implicated in thyroid hormone um, disruption, which is uh, thyroid, the thyroid hormone is critical for the development of the brain and the nervous system. And so disruption of developmental processes like that results in irreversible and permanent impacts. Um, in terms of human epidemiological studies, um, on one particular PBDE, um, it, it, they've been associated with lower birth weight, impaired attention, poor coordination, and lowered IQ. Um, so as you can tell, this class of chemicals, um, there's definitely reason to, to question their use, especially when they're not um, adding a fire safety benefit. Um, and I, I included this uh, infographic here just to highlight um, the prevalence of these chemicals in the environment. PBDEs were phased out um, sort of between 2005 and 2013. And um, data from the CDC indicates that about 97% of Americans have um, at, at least one kind, one congener of PBDE in their bodies. Um, so even though we're not using them anymore, these chemicals are persistent, they stick around in the environment for a long time, um, and, and so we really need to think about whether using these chemicals is beneficial or, or is worth the, the harm that we're um, potentially inflicting on ourselves and on the environment. The other reason we think of flame retardants as a class of chemicals is that there's a history of regrettable substitutions in this case. Um, and what I mean by regrettable substitution is where one chemical is used as a flame retardant and over time um, it's, it's studied and information becomes available that it, that it is harmful either to humans or the environment. Um, and that chemical may be phased out or it might be banned um, and often its replacement chemical is something that we don't have a lot of information on. And uh, over time as that chemical gets studied we find that it has similar health harm. Um, and so. By looking at flame retardants as a class, um, and also by looking at whether or not they're really performing a necessary function, we can avoid this cycle of regrettable substitutions. Um, this picture here is um, the classic whack-a-mole game. Um, often uh, we call this a, a toxic whack-a-mole, so we get rid of one chemical that we know is harmful. Um, but unless we, unless we are replacing it with something that's well studied, um, we're probably just setting ourselves up for this, um, for this recurring cycle. So now back to my topic of insulation. Um, foam plastic insulation can be used to improve building energy efficiency, and it's, it's, um, there are a variety of foam plastic insulation products that can be used throughout the home. So for instance, attic insulation, wall cavities under floors, um, foundation or basement insulation, things like that. Um, and today I'm specifically going to be talking about the below grade applications of foam plastic insulation. And there's a couple reasons for that. Um, so we get a lot of questions from people that aren't in the architecture and building community of well, why would you even put insulation below grade? Um, but below grade insulation can be an important part of achieving energy efficiency needs. Um, it's estimated that below grade insulation can reduce heating bills anywhere from 10 to 25% depending on what part of the United States you're in uh, and how you install the product. And for below grade insulation, uh, moisture retention, the um, R value stability, and also compressive strength are really the critical properties for the insulation product. Uh, the, the current building codes in the US require um, that for certain below grade applications, polystyrene materials be used. Um, and so specifically for frost protected shallow foundations, um, the, the, build, the model building code requires that those materials comply with ASTM C578, which is a standard specifically for polystyrene. Um, while there are some alternative materials that can be used below grade, um, especially for the horizontal under slab insulation, those alternative options tend to cost more, and so they remain a smaller part of the market. Um, and um, in the US, so, so basically foam plastic is, is the primary material used in this application. Um, and it's certainly right now the most affordable. 
Uh, in the U.S., however, all foam plastic insulation, including the products used below grade, contain organohalogen flame retardants um, that are associated with a variety of health and ecological hazards. And I'll briefly describe those flame retardants in the next slide. So the first flame retardant I'll discuss is um, TCPP, or tris one chloro 2 propyl phosphate um, TCPP is used in the spray foams, so polyiso and polyurethane products. And a 2012 paper estimated that 80% of TCPP use is for building insulation. Um, in terms of health impacts, TCPP um, has been shown to accumulate in the liver and kidneys. Um, it can affect nervous system development. Um, and it is a potential carcinogen, so it's very structurally similar to two other flame retardants that have, um, that have been shown to be cancer-causing. Um, unfortunately, there is still limited data on this chemical um, in terms of both health impacts and also potential exposures. Um, NIOSH uh, is currently conducting a study to better understand exposures, um, especially to workers that install spray foam products. Um, and TCPP is used at levels of 2 to 25 percent in rigid boards and at levels of about 5 percent in spray foams. Uh, the other flame retardant that's been really widely used in foam plastic insulation is HBCD, or hexabromocyclododecane. Um, HBCD is uh, bioaccumulative, which means it builds up in the food chain and in the body. Um, it's been associated with uh, thyroid hormone disruption as well. It can affect the developing nervous system and um, has shown to be uh, developmental neurotoxic in, in mice. Um, HBCD was recently listed on the Stockholm Convention of Persistent Organic Pollutants um, because it is a PBT, meaning that it's persistent. It doesn't break down into safer chemicals um, quickly in the environment. Um, it is bioaccumulative and um, because of its toxic impacts. Um, because it was recently listed on the Stockholm Convention, it is expected to decrease um, in insulation, and industry is moving towards an alternative flame return that I'll discuss in a moment. But historically, and, and um, still in, in many cases now, HBCD is commonly used at levels of about 0.7% in EPS and about 2.5% in XPS. Um, polystyrene building insulation is estimated to account for almost 90% of HBCD releases to the environment. Um, which makes sense because about 90% of its use historically has been in insulation. Uh, the other 10% of use um, is in textiles and electrical applications. Um, there isn't information yet to directly characterize human exposure or environmental release um, of HBCD or TCPP directly from insulation when it's installed or in use. Um, but estimates suggest that uh, disposal of insulation is, is probably a primary um, source of these flame retardants in the environment. Um, both HBCD and TCPP are uh, global contaminants, meaning we find them in surface waters and sediments worldwide. Um, they're used additively in insulation, meaning they're not chemically bound to the product. So they can reach out or migrate out of insulation over time throughout the product life cycle, which includes manufacturing, installation, uh, use in buildings, and also disposal. Um, and, and usually disposal for these products means landfilling. Um, so there's definitely an occupational health concern for people who routinely handle, um, cut, and install these materials. Um, and furthermore, the general public can be exposed um, either through insulation, uh, sorry, inhalation, um, dermal contact, or ingestion. Um, both flame retardants have been detected pretty widely in indoor dust um, as well as um, in food. Um, and importantly, because these are both organohalogen chemicals, um, they can increase the production of toxic dioxins, furans, and other combustion products when insulation burns or when it undergoes other um, types of thermal processing. And so if, um, if insulation is involved in a house fire or a landfill fire um, or even during potentially thermal cutting or other thermal processing in the factory, um, these toxic dioxins and furans uh, will be produced, and those are also persistent chemicals. So I mentioned that HPCD is being phased out, and the, re the common replacement is um, the flame retardant that you see on your screen now. Um, it's called um, poly-SR informally. It's a brominated styrene butadiene copolymer. 
um, and it's been licensed to a couple different companies for production. Um, so some of the trade names that you'll find for this chemical are Emerald Innovation 3000, Greencrest, uh, or FR122P. Um, so this flame retardant is a polymer, which is an improvement over the, uh, over the other two chemicals that I just mentioned in terms of human exposures um, and, and environmental relief. So we would expect, um, because this is a really large molecule, we would expect the environmental impacts to be much lower than the two flame retardants I just discussed. That said, there's very limited data available on this flame retardant. Um, the EPA recently did um, an alternative assessment on this material, and a lot of their um, conclusions are based on, um, are based on modeling and predict predictions rather than on empirical data. So we don't really have empirical data on its persistence. Um, or it, namely on its um, environmental breakdown products. So what's going to happen to this chemical um, once, we, once we dispose of insulation and it ends up in the landfill, it may be exposed to sunlight, what's going to happen over time? Um, because it's halogenated and it's a polymer, it, it is expected to be very persistent. Um, and since it's still an organohalogen, um, this will still lead to production of toxic halogenated dioxins and furans when it's burned um, or when it undergoes thermal processing. So it is a slight improvement, um, but from our perspective, it's not really a solution to the problem. So the reason that these flame retardants are added to insulation is because of building code requirements. And in the US, building codes are based on model codes called the I codes or the international codes. Um, these, th this is a suite of codes, including the International Residential Code and the International Building Code. Um, and all of these are um, updated on a three-year revision cycle. So right now, the residential code and some other volumes are being updated. Last year, the international building code was updated. Um, and the intent of these model codes is basically to establish minimum requirements to provide a reasonable level of safety, public health, and general welfare from fire and other hazards attributable to the built environment. These model codes are adopted at the state and or the local level, and so authorities can make amendments or additions to the model codes before they adopt them for their own jurisdiction. Specifically for foam plastic insulation, the model codes um, require that insulation materials, that foam plastic insulation materials meet certain performance requirements um, in a test known as the Steiner Tunnel Test. Um, and you might also see this called ASTM E84 or UL793. And um, this test looks at two different things. One is a flame spread index, so how a flame travels over the product, um, and the other is smoke developed index, so how much smoke is produced during the course of the test. Um, and you, as you can see on this slide, basically this test consists of a chamber with a very large open flame, and the insulation material um, in a, in a long, long board is mounted above that flame. Um, and they measure how quickly the flame um, progresses on, on the insulation board. Um, the specific requirements for flame spread and smoke develop can vary somewhat with the application. Um, so there's a, there's a general requirement for the maximum allowable flame spread and smoke develop, um, but then both the residential and the building code list a variety of exceptions where those, those indices can be different um, for certain applications. Uh, because of the nature of foam plastic materials, flame retardants are added to foam plastic building insulation in order to comply with these limits. Um, and there's a lot of information available to suggest that this test is not really appropriate for foam plastic materials. Um, for example, some will melt and drip, and others may swell up and restrict airflow in the test chamber. So the flame spread index and smoke developed index um, is, not, is generally not considered um, an accurate indicator of fire hazard. Nevertheless, it is a, a part of the code requirements for foam plastic building insulation, and that it is the reason that flame retardants um, are, are used in U.S. Uh, foam plastic building insulation. The other requirement, uh, sort of blanket requirement for foam plastic insulation materials in the U.S. is this thermal barrier requirement. Um, so it's generally recognized that foam plastic insulation, even when it contains flame retardants, should be protected by some kind of barrier um, in order to really provide fire safety in a finished structure. Uh, for most habitable spaces, uh, that, that thermal barrier um, is gypsum board or a similar covering. Um, for other types of spaces, the barrier can be different. Um, sometimes it's, it's a, another, another um, 
another barrier material that doesn't have that same fire resistance as gypsum. Sometimes it's a spray applied ignition barrier. It, it can vary a lot depending on the application. Um, but really the key takeaway here is that even when insulation contains flame retardants, it still needs this other layer of protection um, when it's used in habitable spaces. So those are the U.S. building code requirements. Um, we, we have looked to Scandinavia um, in this project because they recently updated their own codes so that foam plastic insulation materials can be used without flame retardants. Um, Sweden updated its code in about 2001, and Norway was a little bit later in 2004. And um, so they, they have both changed their requirements, and now about 97% of EPS and XPS in these countries uh, does not contain flame retardant chemicals. They haven't seen any increase in fire incidents since those changes, um, and indeed um, references indicate that they were able to do that with minimal changes to construction practice. Um, and their codes are based on, um, on the sort of assembly fire resistance, so they rely a lot more on that thermal barrier protection rather than on the flammability test of the barrier insulation material that I mentioned. And so what we would like to do here in the U.S. Um, is that for below-grade insulation, uh, where the, that barrier is inherently present just because of the way the building is built, um, we're hoping that we can similarly update the codes in the U.S so that uh, the use of flame retardants can be reduced in these materials. To support this work, we have undertaken a series of fire tests. Um, one of the common questions we get is that um, Scandinavia provides a, a fine example, but certainly their construction practices and materials are different enough that we can't uh, apply the lessons learned there directly to U.S. construction. Um, so we were interested in looking at the performance of insulation materials from Scandinavia um, and comparing that to the fire performance of insulation materials in the U.S., specifically in uses um, relevant or in, in test designs relevant to below-grade foam plastic. Um, there's no recognized fire test for below-grade assemblies because it's difficult to envision a, a realistic scenario where below-grade foam uh, would be a major factor in a fire. Um, but we were still interested to see how the materials might compare. Um, so the images that you see right now, um, this was the first test that we ran. Um, and this was to roughly compare performance of insulation underneath a concrete slab uh, in the case of some kind of interior room fire. Um, so what we did here is we, we placed a, a two inch thick concrete paver um, on top of samples of foam plastic, one from Sweden without flame retardants and one from the U.S. with flame retardants. And, um, and we placed a charcoal fire on top of that concrete to simulate, um, to simulate the kind of heat exposure that insulation might get um, if it's installed under a slab in a home that's on fire. Um, and uh, the results of this, um, as you can see from the images, both foams melted um, comparably under the charcoal fire. And there was not any evidence of combustion in this case, um, probably because there's no access to oxygen uh, in this construction. Um, so the foams with and without flame retardants didn't show any significant difference here. The next test that we did was to look at um, cases of potential slab penetration. Um, another, another question that we get when we're talking about below-grade foams is, sure, there's no access to oxygen, except what if you have a penetration in the slab? Um, so we, we did want to look at that. So we constructed, um, this is a, a, bigger, a bigger test design, we constructed um, a four by four square inch opening um, using, again, the two inch thick concrete pavers um, directly on top of foam plastic. Um, and the, the center photo is the foam with flame retardants and the right hand photo is the foam without from Sweden. Um, and what we did is we held a butane torch um, directly over the exposed foam in the center of that four by four inch square opening. Um, and basically both foams here melted and burned where they were directly exposed to the torch, um, but the flame didn't really travel underneath the concrete pavers. Um, neither foam sustained combustion enough to, to self-propagate underneath, um, underneath the concrete pavers. So overall the fire behavior was comparable. Uh, the other concern that we've heard is that um, if, if below-grade insulation were manufactured without flame retardants, we might see a much greater fire hazard um, 
on the work site during construction processes. And a primary concern there is with hot work on site. So we were interested in conducting some tests to um, basically to evaluate whether um, whether foam plastic without flame retardants would be an increased fire hazard um, during construction. So the two uh, major ignition sources in that case that we, that we tried to simulate were um, brazing as well as welding, because those are pretty common um, types of hot work on site. Um, the images you see here are from the brazing test. And for this, a copper pipe was inserted into each sample of foam and heated with a, um, an oxyacetylene brazing torch for five minutes. Um, about three inches from the foam surface. And we allowed the solder from the brazing um, to drip down and come into contact with the foam surface um, just to see whether the foam without flame retardants might ignite or how the performance would differ between the two. And what we observed is that neither hot pipe contact with the foam uh, nor the falling droplets of brazing solder resulted in ignition of the foam plastic insulation. And that was true for the US insulation with flame retardants as well as the Swedish insulation without. Uh, and finally, um, as I mentioned, we looked at welding. Um, so we allowed drops of molten steel um, welding slag to fall on foam plastic insulation with and without flame retardants from a height of about three feet. Um, and neither sample in this case of the foam plastic insulation sustained flame propagation away from the point of contact of the molten slag. Um, you'll see in the photo on the right, the foam without flame retardants, there is one spot where the welding slag um, briefly sustained a small flame, but that flame self-extinguished about two and a half seconds after the slag hit the foam plastic. So overall, um, even without flame retardants in the Swedish insulation samples, um, we didn't see uh, an increase in construction site fire hazard um, from these materials. Um, it's worth noting that no foam plastic insulation material should be exposed to, um, to hot work on the job site. Um, the fire code, as well as OSHA regulations and NFPA standards for worksite safety all require that foam plastics and other combustible materials um, be covered during hot work to prevent ignition or fire. Avery, uh, there was a question here I thought I, would, I thought might be pretty relevant. Um, were you, did you test both EPS and XPS, or, or which one? Yeah, that's a great question. I noticed that. Um, so this, all of these results are written up in detail in a white paper that's on, um, that's the Google uh, link at the bottom of the slide there. Um, so it, it, it um, provides about a half page description of the materials that we used for this testing. Uh, off the top of my head, I, I, I think we would have used the same material for both tests, but I actually don't remember which one it was. So I would have to look back at that. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to answer more questions about this testing, um, so feel free to contact me. My email is on the uh, title slide of this presentation, and it'll be on the, on the last slide as well. Thanks. Yeah. So this leads into um, work that we're doing now to try to update codes. Um, we've seen that there, uh, that there is not reason to believe that uh, foam plastic below grade without flame retardants will increase fire hazards. And so we're involved right now in a collaborative initiative to update codes um, to enable the optional use of these materials below grade. Um, so this is a, a coalition called the Safer Insulation Solution, which um, is a group of architects, builders, scientists, fire safety experts, uh, firefighters, health and environmental ad advocates, and also leading companies um, that are interested in safely reducing the use of flame retardants where they're not needed. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about our current effort to update the International Residential Code. Um, and uh, in addition, the Safer Insulation Solution is interested in possibly updating um, state and local codes. Um, why change the building codes? Um, so I, I mentioned the issue of regrettable substitution um, with flame retardants. And so because of the way flammability standards are written, they can't require um, that a certain material could be used for compliance. So in terms of addressing chemicals of concern, um, changing the flammability standards, especially where they're not providing a fire safety benefit, is really the best way um, to reduce the use of toxics um, in, in construction materials. Um, and so that's why we're interested in, in updating the code rather than focusing specifically on the, on the chemical um, 
on the chemical side. That we're not going through the EPA to ban materials, for instance. We just want to make it possible to safely use these materials without flame retardants. Um, furthermore, the alternative materials that are available right now um, are typically um, more expensive. They're at a price premium. And so by updating the codes, uh, we will be able to expand the available options of affordable materials to include insulation without flame retardants. And these would be appropriate um, for, uh, for a wider variety of building projects, most importantly, um, affordable construction projects. Um, and, for, and furthermore, because of the, um, the intent of the code, which I read earlier, um, a requirement that doesn't improve fire safety, such as the flame spread and smoke developed requirements for below grade foams, um, is really in direct opposition to the intent statement um, because it's leading to the use of harmful um, or untested persistent flame retardants. So the proposal that we are um, working on now uh, is proposal number RB152-16 for the International Residential Code. And um, if you're interested in learning more about this, you can contact me, and you can also find this printed in the monograph on the ICC website. Um, I'm, I'm happy to send that link to, to people who, who want it. Um, our proposal specifically is looking at the low-grade foam plastic insulation. So it's a very, uh, very specific, very limited um, proposal, and what we're asking is for materials installed where they're going to be sufficiently protected below grade um, to, um, to be able to be used without flame retardants. It wouldn't be a requirement, so it's still going to be an optional, uh, an optional um, section of the code. Um, and we have included language in that proposal uh, requiring that foam plastic without flame retardants be labeled for below grade use only so that it can be kept separate on the job site from other materials. Um, and the, the requirements in this proposal, um, as you can see on the slide here, so our proposal would cover the, the yellow insulation indicated. Um, it would not apply to the orange section of insulation indicated. And we did that for a couple of reasons. Um, so we're targeting specifically the below grade installations where there's no fire hazard. And we wanted to make sure that insulation is protected throughout the course of use. Um, and the six inch depth below grade is the depth right now currently required for additional protection of foam plastic, of exterior foam plastic. Um, so if insulation is installed deeper than six inches, we know that uh, due to erosion or possibly due to digging on site, that insulation is going to stay protected. Um, additionally, we haven't addressed the slab edge insulation just because the, the uh, installation requirements for slab edge foam can vary a lot from project to project, and we wanted to make this as simple as possible, um, as well as guaranteeing that the insulation without flame retardants is fully protected um, throughout the course of use. So this is a, this is a simplified um, depiction of what we've proposed. And again, if you're interested in more details, I'm happy to follow up separately, or you can also um, actually read our proposal language um, online. And we've actually posted this as well um, to saferinstallation.org, which might be easier to find than going to the ICC's website. The next step, since we've already submitted this code proposal, is to, um, is to um, support this at code committee hearings in Kentucky. Um, so this and all of the other proposals that were submitted in January um, will be considered by different, uh, different committees um, at what they call the committee action hearings. And um, so basically a, a panel of 14 building officials, fire safety experts, um, and others will, uh, will hear testimony in support and against um, the proposal and, uh, and will decide whether or not they think it's appropriate to include it in the code. Um, and then the results from that hearing will be posted May 6th. And if you happen to be interested, I believe the hearings are webcast, so you can actually um, dial in and watch them from home on your computer. Um, then what can you do? Um, so we're, it, this is a long-term effort. Um, we, we do have this proposal up in front of the committee next month, but, um, but this is an ongoing project to try to safely reduce the use of flame retardants in foam plastic insulation. 
And so specifically right now our immediate need is um, letters of support. Um, the Google link on the screen here will take you to an easy um, sign-on letter if your company is interested in, um, in supporting this proposal. Um, if you feel passionately about this issue, we welcome you to attend and testify at code hearings. Um, the, the hearings next month are the 17th to the 27th, um, and I can provide you with more information if you're interested. And long term, we're, we're looking for architecture, engineering, and construction professionals who would be willing to provide us with technical assistance um, as well as spread the word. Um, and we, we welcome other ideas as well for uh, ways that you might be able to support this effort. Um, and if you are interested in that, either short term or long term, please feel free to get in touch with me uh, or your visit our website, saferinsulation.org. Um, so I want to discuss just um, uh, a couple other pieces here. Um, so we're looking now at updating flammability requirements for foam plastic, where the, where the materials are protected by a barrier. Um, and the state of California has really led the way on this. Um, in 2012, Governor Brown uh, made a statement um, referring specifically to California's furniture flammability requirements, um, saying that we must find better ways to meet fire safety standards by reducing and eliminating, wherever possible, dangerous chemicals. Um, and so, in fact, after making that statement, the state of California uh, revisited its furniture flammability regulations, uh, which had previously led to the use of flame retardants in all flexible um, furniture filling, flexible foam furniture filling for, uh, for about four decades. And so they recently updated that. Um, and so the new standard, TB117-2013, does maintain fire safety, um, but it, it does not uh, need to be met with flame retardants. And so manufacturers um, can and are increasingly moving towards furniture without flame retardants, um, which is a great precedent. Um, and California similarly had legislation, um, Assembly Bill 127, asking the state fire marshal to look into flammability requirements for foam plastic insulation. And I think that that process is ongoing. Um, but they have really led the way in thinking about fire safety in a more holistic way that, in, that includes um, the potential impacts from flame retardants. The uh, American Public Health Association recently um, voiced support for updating building codes and flammability standards. Um, they published a policy statement. Um, if you go to their website, it's number 20156, and the link is on the bottom of the slide. Um, they produced a, a great uh, background document on flame retardants used in insulation and um, the public health um, perspective on, on why codes should be updated. Um, and uh, that includes here at the end some recommendations for, um, for what the public health community and others can do to safely reduce flame retardants uh, in building insulation to protect public health. Um, and specifically, they, they um, recommended that um, state and local governments consider updates to codes that would protect public health by allowing for reduced use of flame retardants. Um, so it's really fantastic to see this kind of statement from the public health community um, highlighting the fact that building insulation really can and does impact public health um, of people and of the environment that we live in. Um, and finally, uh, we, there is also support from first responders. Um, the International Association of Firefighters in 2014 um, approved a resolution uh, discussing the, the various health impacts of flame retardant chemicals uh, and acknowledging that um, the IFF will work to ensure that the use of flame retardants and other chemicals um, are eliminated and safer alternatives or methods are pursued. And they um, they have been really wonderful uh, in terms of providing technical information to this effort to update codes. Um, they've been really great in updating furniture standards as well. So it's, it's great to see first responders um, and, uh, and firefighters really acknowledging that flame retardants don't provide the fire safety benefit in a lot of cases that, they, um, that we've all assumed that they do. Um, finally, here's a list of supporters of organizations who, um, who have signed on to support efforts to update the International Building Code and or the International Residential Code. 
Um, this is a great list and we would love to see more logos added to it. Um, and so again, if you are interested in quickly signing on, um, that link is again on the top right side of this slide. Um, we have an immediate need for the hearing in April, but we are interested definitely in long-term support for this work. And uh, I think that's everything, so we have some time for questions. Um, thank you again to the Green Home Institute for hosting, and um, yeah, and if you have any other questions on uh, what I presented, don't hesitate to get in touch. All right, great. Thanks, Avery, and, and, and thanks, everyone. Uh, we've definitely got some time here for questions, and I already do see a few uh, rolling in. Um, here's another one from uh, Dan. When is exposure to the potentially harmful flame retardant chemicals most likely to happen? Manufacturing, exposure to flame, or over time uh, due to degradation from the sun or, or soil contact, for example? Yeah, that's a really great question, and unfortunately, um, there's not a lot of information to, to mm -hmm. answer that specifically. Um, so I mentioned flame retardants have been detected in a variety of environmental media. So they're in surface waters, they're in soils. Um, HBCD has been detected in foods, in the grocery store. Um, and, and so we know that environmental exposure is one piece of that, and it's thought that disposal of insulation at the end of life is a, is a primary contributor. So once we landfill insulation, um, there are landfill fires, which can lead to the release of dioxins and furans, as well as the flame retardants. Um, flame retardants will also leach out over time into landfill, uh, into landfill leachate, um, which sometimes can be applied to fields. Um, so there, there are a variety of different possible exposure routes. Uh, one of the things we're really interested in, in understanding better is how uh, building inhabitants might be exposed over time. Um, so for instance, if you have wall cavity insulation, it is, uh, it is in, the insulation is enclosed behind a thermal barrier, um, but there is a lot of reason to believe that, uh, that, in, that flame retardants in that insulation are migrating out over time um, into the living space. Um, however, no studies have been done to directly um, demonstrate or quantify that. Um, so right now we don't have we don't have a specific answer to that question. We only know that these flame retardants are detected um, both in indoor dust as well as in a variety of environmental media. And so we are looking at this um, largely from the life cycle perspective, where um, you know, ev every stage along the insulation life cycle from manufacturing to disposal provides opportunities for flame retardant exposure, um, especially to, to installers and workers, but also to the general population. Thanks. Um, here's a question. I think mostly talking about what are the plans to measure um, the impact that this code change will have uh, below grade as far as um, measuring if there will be a, uh, a reduced environmental impact, positive environmental impact. And, and maybe I can add to that a little bit. And has there been anyone measuring um, this effort in Scandinavia to, to show that uh, there have been less um, flame retardants impacting the environment based on their changes? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so I'm not aware of any published information out of Scandinavia, although I would expect that to be something that, that people are looking into. Um, in terms of our below-grade effort, um, I, I mentioned we, don't, we unfortunately don't have data directly to quantify migration of these materials, uh, of flame retardants out of these materials once they're installed. Um, however, we are talking. We, we um, are talking to different researchers who are interested in looking at um, possible migration of flame retardants from below grade uh, installations, um, both in how that might impact soil as well as um, local surface and groundwater. Um, and so we hope that within the within the coming years we will have some. Um, some measure of how re removing flame retardants from that application um, can impact um, can, can impact environmental exposures on a on a local level. Thanks. And here's a question, and actually this ties into something I definitely wanted to ask, and it touches on a point you brought up. The the question from Sylvia here is, are there any bio-based materials as substitute? But 
Uh, sort of at a larger question or adding into the larger question, um, you had mentioned some of the alternatives are, are costly. Um, what are some of the alternatives, at least that you know about, that the Green Science Policy Institute knows about and um, at least may be able to, to recommend um, even if they do have a higher cost? Yeah, so there are certain mineral-based flame retardants that can be used below grade, um, yeah. as well as foam glass, I believe, is one alternative um, mm -hmm. specific foam glass, the yeah. applications. Um, in terms of bio-based materials, um, I'm not aware of any that are widely used in below grade applications, um, which, it, which is another reason that this code change proposal is focused on below grade um, specifically. So the, hmm. the um, bio-based materials, so I, I know there's um, sort of micellar insulation, uh, hmm. sort of mushroom-based insulation materials and other um, cellulosic materials that can be used for other applications. Um, and, and it's great for projects that can afford those materials and or, um, and or have the knowledge to use the alternative materials. Um, we, we definitely support that. Um, that said, the low grade foam plastic remains really uh, the lion's share of the, of the available uh, materials. And so that, that is one reason that this code change is specifically targeting below grade because for a lot of projects there aren't there aren't viable um, sort of quote unquote healthier healthier alternatives. Right. You know, I know I know uh, there is a rigid rock wool that just recently came out, um, mm -hmm. and, and I don't believe it has any flame retardants in it, and it has been approved for uh, below grade. And I would also question as to whether it might even be cheaper, um, if not cost competitive, with with um, foam based. Have you heard anything about that? Yeah, that's great to hear. I had heard rock wool um, could be up to twice the cost right now, okay. um, but I but I don't know specifically for the below grade material. So that's that's something yeah. I'll look into. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of different. I mean, there's stuff for below grade. There's exterior walls. There's um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know roofing, and so there's a different. There's definitely different products there. Um, so there's these XPS and EPS being manufactured. I assume it's being manufactured in Scandinavia. The ones that don't have um, that don't have flame retardants in it. Um, even if this code will, it w was being changed, um, wh how would you know that any of the manufacturers would just suddenly stop putting flame retardants in their materials uh, here in the U.S.? Uh, yeah, I'm glad you asked that. So the, the image, um, let's see, on this slide of, of why to change codes uh, we purposefully used stepping stones here because the mm -hmm. code change piece is really just the first step. Um, mm -hmm. So right now, those materials are just not available in the U.S. because of the code mm -hmm. requirements, and we view the, the change in the code as the first step that would enable their production. It would enable people to really request these materials in their projects, and, I, and it, would, it would take some market demand. Um, in order for manufacturers then to begin producing um, insulation without flame retardants. Um, and and that's, uh, that's how we, you know, that is how we would uh, measure the, the success is, uh, you know, all of our partners who are supporting this work um, uh, either, either are doing, will do construction projects or work with clients um, who might be interested in mm -hmm. reducing toxics in their projects. Um, and so for, for those projects where it makes sense, they could request these materials um, and, and um, the market would eventually shift to meet that demand. Mm -hmm. Here's an inch, I mean, we brought up uh, rock wool or mineral wool and um, someone had mentioned that there's formaldehyde in that. Um, so it sounds like, you know, there could be trade-offs, but uh, what, what would, in your opinion, or what would be worse, the formaldehyde or the flame retardants? Uh, well, that's a tough question, um, but in yeah. my mind, the flame retardants, so I mentioned the persistence piece. Um, because right. flame retardants are organohalogens, they really don't break down into safer mm -hmm. chemicals on a, on a meaningful time scale. Mm -hmm. um, and so just because they stick around on the planet for so long and because of, uh, because of the production of dioxins and furans at elevated temperatures, um, I, I do think that the, the flame retardants are, are an issue that we need to resolve. And hopefully, I know companies are, mm -hmm. they can, moving away from formaldehyde as well. And it's it certainly, I don't want to downplay the, 
um, the importance of, of mm -hmm. thinking about things like formaldehyde, um, especially uh, in products that are in living spaces. Um, sure. But I, I don't know how the formaldehyde and mineral wool below grade uh, may be different, and I, I don't know the, the levels either that they're using. So. Well, great. Uh, is there any? I don't see. I don't see any other. I don't see any other questions here? So, real quick again, um, Avery. Unless another question comes in, you just want to uh, re-remind us where people can uh, get involved and how they can contact you. Sure. Um, so you can reach me at my, either my email, which is my first name, Avery, at greensciencepolicy.org, and that's on the cover slide. Um, and probably some other slides in this presentation. Um, if you want to learn more, definitely visit our website, which is www.saferinsulation.org, um, or the Green Science Policy Institute's website, that's um, www.greensciencepolicy.org, and you should be able to fill out contact forms on either one of those websites as well if you, uh, if you prefer that uh, to contacting me directly. All right, Avery, well, thank you for your time today. Thanks for everyone for joining us. Um, enjoy the rest of your week. Take care. Thank you.